Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. On this video, it's the updated manual mode response check for EC-135 helicopters. I had made this video a while ago, earlier in the year, but then Pratt & Whitney revised their maintenance manual and made some pretty decent changes, so we're going to go over that. I'll, leave, I'll, put the, I'll put a link to the old video at the very end. Just uh, just so there's like a record of it. But if you search for it, this is the video that's going to pop up. All right. So we're going to go over the manual mode response check. We're going to go over the manual. And then we're also going to uh, review. We're going to go over why, why we do this, what Pratt & Whitney's talking about, and the parts that might affect this FMM to make it fail or cause problems. Okay. And to be honest, the reason I made this video originally is because apparently last year, uh, we oversped two engines because they weren't reading the maintenance manual. So just a quick review. You go to Pratt & Whitney's maintenance manual, chapter 73, 2110. Scroll down to paragraph 6, which is inspections and checks. And if you scroll down a little bit to chapter or paragraph B, it says FMM, which is your fuel management module. Auto to manual to auto mode response check. That's what we're doing today. So the first warning here is all the procedures to be carried out in accordance with the applicable aircraft manual. Have a pilot run it up unless you're qualified. All right, now, right below that is a caution, and it says deleted. Well, previously, it said, do this procedure with all other engines in shutdown state. So when this revision came out, and you go look at the manual, and you're like, wait a minute, this is a huge change. Yeah, it was. It, seemed, it didn't seem right, because... Yeah, they wanted you to do it one engine at a time in fears that you're going to blow up your engine or whatever. So, so I just reached out to the tech support for Pratt & Whitney and eventually got an email back. I asked him if that was an error that they deleted that caution and are we for sure supposed to run both engines at, engines at the same time. Uh, and this is from Bob, our tech rep here over where I'm at. And he says that I've confirmed the reason for the requirement is to have both engines running. Let me just read it, okay? Changes was made to prevent the NF overspeed during such tests either due to the misrigging, pilot errors, or an issue with the FMM. In the event of an unusual increase in power on manual engine during switchover, opposite engine in auto mode will immediately reduce power and offload and allowing the entire main rotor load to be carried by the manual engine thus preventing NR and F overspeed. Okay, that makes sense, kind of. But that just means that you're going to see different things than you're, than you're used to, all right? Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Bob. All right, now let's just go back to the manual. All right, back in the manual. First thing, start both engines and operate them in auto mode at flight idle, which is 100%. So put both engine control switches to flight, not idle, because that's confusing. It says flight idle. Anyway, flight. We're doing engine number one right now. Increase the load of engine number one to reach NG, which is N1, to 85% plus or minus 1% and stabilize it for 30 seconds. Done. All right, at this point, this is the big difference between previously and since it's been revised. Before you had one engine running, now you have both engines running at 85%. Okay, that's a lot. It's got a lot of power. The helicopter wants to take off, so you're going to need full fuel, and you're going to need a couple of dudes to sit in there. Maybe get your flight crew. Otherwise, it's going to get really light on the skids, okay? Record the engine number one torque value in percentage as a reference. This is your starting reference point. Then switch the engine number one from auto to manual mode using the auto manual switch and closely monitor for 20 seconds. Monitor the torque during transition. So for the number one engine, the torque dropped to 44.0 from 48.5. Also, the number two engine went from 48.5 to 53.0. Okay, it doesn't really talk about that in the maintenance manual, so I don't, I don't know. It doesn't say look at the other engine. It says just look at this engine, because this is the one that's in manual mode. Also, the N1s between engine one and two are split. Not crazy amount, but like, uh, what's it say there? Like three or four, something like that. Next, switch engine number one from manual to auto mode using your switch and monitor it for 20 seconds. Monitor the torque during the transition. All right? Okay, no worries. 
it stabilizes, takes a couple seconds, and the torque value on number one goes up to 49.5, and number two comes back down to 49.0. They're about even now, like they were when we first started. And then the N1s are pretty much equal, 85.3, it looks like. And then the next thing it says to do, do this again for engine number two. Next step, seven. The engine torque transition value should always stay between plus or minus 10 of the previously established reference value, which means the original reference value. For example, if the recorded engine torque value is 53%, subtract and add 10% to 53 to get torque limit in the response check. In this example, the minimum limit is 53 minus 10, which is 43, and then the upper limit is 53 plus 10, which equals 63. It's not going to go there and stay there. It's just going to flicker at that point real quick. Okay, then the next step, it says if any engine transition torque values exceed these limits, refer to the fault isolation chart, and we're going to go over that here in a little while. There's a couple other cautions that we need to read real fast, though. Hold on. To prevent engine overspeed, once 85 NG is obtained, the collective should not be moved again until the affected engine is confirmed to be in auto mode. So don't forget that, okay? Don't go pulling up on the collective or pushing down on the collective when it's in manual mode. The other caution, to prevent engine overspeed, the throttle grips are not to be manipulated during these procedural steps. Yeah, so don't just, just tell the pilot just to leave the collective where it is once you establish 85% at the beginning. So that's the check. So if you did that, and the, if the torque didn't fluctuate more than 10 plus or minus, then you're good. Then it's done. Job is done, okay? But if it did fluctuate more than 10, then you need to go to the maintenance manual on the uh, troubleshooting. And we're going to go over that real fast. Engine control mode, auto manual transition discrepancy. That's the one you're going to look at, and we're going to go through it. Okay, what was the result of the FMM auto to manual to auto mode response check? Is it serviceable? Well, if it is, continue normal engine operation. Congra congratulations. If it's not, no. Do a check of the PLA rigging. That's from the aircraft. That's from the aircraft twist grips all the way to the FMM. Check the rigging. Is it okay? Yes. Yes, it's okay. Then what do they want you to do in the Pratt & Whitney manual? Oh, they want you to check the P3 air supply to the FMM. Is it serviceable? Well, let's just say it's not. And then you go ahead and you go clean the number eight bearing seal housing in the engine. You put it all back together. You do this whole job. Again, the manual mode response check. And if it still fails, then they want you to change your FMM. That means all that garbage from the P3 air supply went into your FMM and screwed it up. So that's pretty simple. But let's just go over the uh, number eight bearing steel housing and the P3 air and how it how it works just briefly. All right, just a quick review. So right here is uh, from the maintenance manual of the engine, the Pratt & Whitney 206B2 is what we're looking at. This is the front bearing seal housing for the number eight bearing and the P3 fitting that goes onto the side of it. And inside of there fills up with a lot of garbage. All the dust that flies into your engine goes into your P3. All the grass, if you're landing in the fields and you're landing at scenes and you're a lot of cut grass in the summer and the spring or whatever, and it goes into your intake, it chops all that grass up and turns it into dust and it goes into your P3. Or, or you know, some of it does and the rest of it goes, gets burnt up and goes out the back. But this thing will get filled up with a lot of dirt. It's just tiny, 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 fine dust particles and it just jams it up. It gets all caked inside of there. It screws up the seal. Your first sign that this thing's clogged up is that your seal is starting to leak oil. The P3 air supply comes from your P3 air from your compressor. The plumbing is internal inside of the engine. The first time it comes out of the engine is this fitting right here. That's your P3 nipple is what they call it. And this is your front bearing seal housing, your number eight bearing seal housing, all right? It's, your, it's right on your output drive. And if you follow this line, this line goes to the FMM. So essentially, your front housing is like your P3 filter because there's no P3 filter on this, on this engine, which is fine. I mean, honestly, I really haven't ran into too many problems with this, but it will definitely get a lot of garbage in there. But this red line shows the flow of the P3 air comes out of the engine, goes into the housing right here. It pressurizes the housing with the seal it's a carbon seal, 
but it works with pressure. And on the backside of that seal is that it's open, like all the way around this whole seal is a big space between the seal and the housing. So that air can go all the way around the seal and pressurize it. So part of that air goes into the, the housing and the other part of the air goes up into the FMM. It goes up this tube and around into the P3 air fitting for the, or the P3 air input for the fuel management module. So if we look at the cross section of the reduction gearbox, the red lines are pointing to the, the number eight uh, bearing seal and the seal housing. And it's kind of hard to see, but we're going to zoom in. But there's a huge gap, like I was saying, between the housing and the seal so that air can go all the way around the seal and pressurize the seal. If, this, if that space gets filled in with a whole bunch of dust and a bunch of crap, then it's not going to seal very well. Here's a picture of the seal. The, and obviously, it seals the output drive. Right at the bottom of this lip, you'll get oil coming out of there, or oil will start to pool up there because the seal won't seal very well. This one is a, is a good seal. This one's clean. I don't know what these little particles are. It looks like dust or whatever, but there's no oil coming out of there, which is good. All right, that's it for the manual mode response check that we do on the 200-hour engine inspections. It's pretty easy. All you got to do is make sure that the NG that they're talking about is N1 on your screen. Both engines at flight in auto mode until you go do the check for each engine. Switch it to manual. Um, don't jockey the throttles ever, and don't move the collective. Once you're stabilized at 85%, it's pretty easy. Write your numbers down. Like I said, it will fluctuate right when you flip the switch, just a tiny bit, usually one, two, three percent, plus or minus. I've never seen anything really above five. Um, if you do, you probably need a new FMM or your bearing housing is jammed up with a whole bunch of garbage. Anyway, that's this video. I hope you guys found some value in it. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.